I went to Nashville this week, and did you know that this time of the year in Nashville, absolutely everything that can bloom is blooming, and it's blowing everywhere. The weather was so odd, it was 30 one night, it was 82 one day. The place that I was staying, the retreat center, had not turned on the air yet. They still had the heat, so in order not to suffocate in the rooms, you had to open all the windows, which let all the pollen blow into your room, and you mingled that with the mold that was already there and those kinds of things. So this is why I sound like this today. I managed to have some really nice allergies while I was there. Well, this morning, we read a text that had an important line in it. But the story seemed like nonsense, and they refused to believe them. I began hearing about a film titled Mary Magdalene sometime last year. I was mildly interested, hoping the title character might receive some better treatment than she had in Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ or Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. But when I read that it was to be released on Good Friday this year, I decided it would be a wonderful Holy Saturday experience. We made plans to see the movie that Saturday and then have lunch to discuss afterwards this woman that we know so very little about, Mary Magdalene. It would have been the perfect way to move from Holy Week to Easter Sunday. But it turned out there was just one problem. The film, which was released all over the world in the two weeks leading up to Easter, was not going to be released in the United States. Not on March 30th, perhaps not at all. Because it was caught in a legal limbo. The film was produced by a company tied up in a scandal amidst sexual abuse allegations. The woman who plays Mary Magdalene in the film has described all the drama surrounding it as Shakespearean. When the movie was filmed over a year ago, no one could have guessed how pertinent it was for our time. No one would have guessed that this movie would land in the midst of Me Too and Time's Up. We know very little about all of the women who appear in the story of Jesus, the story that is found in the Gospels. We know the least about Mary Magdalene, and what we think we know about her is distorted. One of the central elements of her story centers on her being a prostitute. We now know that this polarized, centuries-long characterization of her is not historical fact. Pope Gregory I made that leap in the 6th century, and it stuck. And even though the Catholic Church scrubbed that idea in 1969, the label of prostitute did not go away. Because once we are branded, it's awfully hard to to redeem our true self. The gospel text for today, as much of the gospels, was written almost 2,000 years ago. It was probably recorded between 700 and 100 years after the death of Jesus. It's one of the four Gospels that give us accounts of the life, death, and life from death of Jesus the Christ. Amazingly, for its historical time and context, stories of women are included. At times, they're referred to as a group of women. Other times, we have a little more detail about their lives, But their stories being present at all is very important. The recent discoveries of earlier manuscripts have provided data in which women are more prominent. And in these writings, we hear of Mary Magdalene being a leader in the early church, a prophet and a mystic, a woman who praised and loved Jesus, and in conflict often with his other disciples. In 1896, pages from a Gospel of Mary, were recovered in Cairo and sent to Berlin. The trail to authenticate this Gospel sounds like a script for another film that maybe would get released too. Much of the information for the unreleased film of Mary Magdalene came from the few pages that scholars have of this Gospel. And interestingly, some other scholars have claimed 
that Mary Magdalene was perhaps the actual writer of the Gospel of John. If you read the three synoptic Gospels that are very much alike, and then you read the Gospel of John, you see how very different those stories are written. But even with the Gospel of Mary in those earlier texts, we still know very little about this woman. We don't know her age or her economic status, although it's believed she helped finance the ministry of Jesus along with several other women. We don't know her education, what she looked like, or about her sex life, but many have speculated she was the wife of Jesus. We don't know about her occupation, her family, or her death, although many claim to know exactly where she's buried. Although Mary Magdalene is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke as a follower and a supporter of Jesus who exercised her demons, she only really appears in the Gospels at the cross and at the tomb. She seems to have come out of nowhere in the crucifixion scenes, although she is said to have accompanied Jesus to Jerusalem from his ministry in Galilee. But we have confused her with all the other Marys in the gospel. We can surmise Mary was definitely the most popular name for girls around the first century in Galilee, because there's a ton of them. While she might have been the Mary who anoints Jesus in John chapter 12, or the woman in Luke chapter 7 who was a woman of the city and a sinner with an alabaster jar filled with ointment, or even the woman in John chapter 8, the unnamed woman caught in adultery. Historians believe Mary Magdalene appeared in none of those stories, and yet tradition, tradition, has woven her story for these unrelated narratives in the gospel. It's so hard to know what to believe, isn't it? Wouldn't it be nice if we had a clean, accurate picture of this woman so we could attach to her all our hopes and dreams for women, both in the first century and the present moment? It's not a stretch for me to believe Mary Magdalene's role in the early church was one of prominence. After all, Mary Magdalene and the other women at the tomb were the church in the early morning moments of Easter. They are the ones who held the story and went to the male disciples who, of course, thought their stories seemed like nonsense and refused to believe them. Even though Mary Magdalene was the central character in the Gospel of John's account of the resurrection, her presence at the tomb is upstaged by the drama of the subsequent narratives. Narratives which depict Jesus authorizing and sending only men to tell the story. Mary Magdalene is not even mentioned in the list of those said to have seen the risen Christ in the epistle of 1 Corinthians, which further contributes to the diminishment of her role. And by the way, that book in the New Testament is called 1 Corinthians not one Corinthians. If you're going to be the leader of a Christian nation, you should at least know the names of the books of the Bible in the New Testament. At least I think so. (laughs) The problem with writing women out of the story of Jesus is that the appearance of the risen Christ only to men became regarded as the foundation of belief in the resurrection. And it has also become a powerful source of male authority, which translates into patriarchy then and patriarchy now. Even non-feminist scholars agree that centuries of elite and male-centered interpretations and stereotypes have garbled and nearly erased the contribution of women and non-elite men from our histories. And for the women then, for the women through the centuries since that time, and for us, for all of us, this is problematic. Since the beginnings of our last presidential election, we have felt the tremendous weight of sexism. Women's stories have been debated. They have been ridiculed. All 
the stereotypes of the centuries have been told and retold. And when in the midst of our new political reality, women began telling stories of sexual abuse and misconduct, some people thought their stories seemed like nonsense and they refused to believe them. Even women who have suffered the same exact circumstances have questioned their stories or publicly told them to get over it because it's something we all go through, which is true. What we don't realize is these reactions are the ways we keep women oppressed. These reactions keep women quiet. These reactions look down on women who seem hell-bent on making trouble. Cecile Richards, who was with us on Friday night, quotes Representative John Lewis in her new book. Lewis said, Sometimes you have to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble, to make a way out of no way. The resurrection courage that Mary Magdalene and all the other women felt on that early morning so long ago is needed now more than ever. As one strong and courageous pastor said, now more than ever, we are called to a movement of truth-telling in a world determined to squash women's stories, hell-bent on destroying them in political rhetoric, twisting them in Twitter frenzies, and pimping them for profit and gain. I kind of have this feeling some of that stuff was said about Mary Magdalene. So not just on Resurrection Sunday, but each morning when we awake to another injustice, we are called to remind the world that death, destruction, and despair will not have the final word. Resurrection courage is still at work among us and within us. It is calling out to us to proclaim to a dying world that Jesus is in our midst. Jesus the Christ still walks before us, seeking a path of righteousness and power, calling and leading us with love and care to become the people who hear the stories of women and believe them. Because it is our job to live and not die, to speak and vote justice, to pray and to rally, to be the people of God filled with resurrection courage and resurrection power. Many of you know that I'm not a big fan of preaching from this pulpit. That was built by men for men. Yes, it's way too big for me. And yes, climbing up and down on this box that Leo Lopez built for me scares me each and every time I'm up here. This pulpit, I got to tell you, was not made for heels. I would much rather teach and preach and speak from the center aisle walking among you. That's my preference. But I am not unaware of what my standing in this pulpit means for our church and for women, especially those women who still find themselves in congregations that have pulpits occupied only by men. I was so proud of our church on Friday night when I gave the welcome for Cecile Richards. And I loved bringing greetings from our senior minister, Scott Colglazer, telling that beautiful group about Scott serving on the board of Planned Parenthood, even when he was the pastor of a church in Texas. We sometimes forget Texas is still in the Bible Belt, even if it is on the western frontier. And in the years that Scott was involved with Planned Parenthood, it cost him dearly in the church that he served. I also loved telling the group that night that our church was started by a woman 151 years ago, and that women in this church have been making trouble ever since. 
On this day, we can all be proud of the strides we have made as a congregation. It would be easy to rest on our laurels, but our work is not done. We are now all called to live into the legacy of the first apostle, Mary Magdalene. And we are called to live into the legacy of our founder, Amanda Scott. Most importantly, we are called to support and remember the women, the women through the ages who told their stories to break the bonds of oppression. My prayer is that together we will answer this call. May it be so. May it be so for all of us. Amen. <laughs>